Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm a college student living in Denver, Colorado. Between tuition and my textbooks, I couldn't afford my small apartment on my own anymore. My part-time job at the campus bookstore barely covered groceries, and I was constantly stressed about making rent. So finally, I decided that it was time to look for a roommate to help share with the expenses. After posting an ad on Craigslist, I received a few responses, but one guy stood out. A guy named Mike seemed perfect. He was around my age, worked as an ID specialist, and he had good references. Plus, he was willing to move in immediately, which was a big plus for me. Mike and I met at a coffee shop near my apartment, and he seemed like a decent guy. Tall, athletic build, short brown hair, and an easygoing demeanor. We talked for a while and everything checked out. He showed me his references, which included a guy named Steve who vouched for him over the phone. I figured that I had finally found my new roommate. Mike moved in the following weekend. At first, everything was great. He paid his half of the rent on time, he kept the common areas clean, and we even hung out a few times. We grabbed some beers, watched some movies, you know, typical roommate stuff. But then, things started to get weird. It began with small things, like I would hear footsteps in the middle of the night, even though I knew that Mike was in his room. Doors would be slightly ajar when I was sure that I had closed them. I just chalked it up to my imagination or just me being forgetful, or maybe the old building settling. But then it got worse. One night, I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep, when I heard faint whispers coming from the hallway. I got up, thinking Mike might be on a late night phone call. But when I opened my door, the hallway was empty. I peeked into Mike's room and he was sound asleep snoring softly. I just shook it off as a dream or maybe the wind playing tricks on me. A few days later, I came home from class to find Mike in the living room rummaging through my backpack. Startled, I asked him what he was doing. Oh, sorry man, I thought it was mine. I was just looking for my charger. He said with an awkward laugh. I found it odd, but I just let it go. However, I started to notice other things going missing. Small items like my keys, my wallet, even my favorite hoodie. They would always turn up in strange places in the house, like the back of the closet or under the couch cushions. I confronted Mike about it, but he always had a reasonable explanation or claimed that he didn't know anything about it. One night, I stayed up late studying for an exam, and around 2 a.m., I heard a noise coming from the attic. Our building had a small attic space accessible through a hatch in the hallway ceiling. But I have never been up there before. Curious and a bit on edge, I grabbed the flashlight and quietly made my way to the hatch. As I climbed the ladder and I pushed the hatch open, I was hit by a musty smell and a wave of cold air. Shining my flashlight around, I saw boxes of old junk, some cobwebs and dust, you know, nothing too unusual. But then, in the corner, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There was a makeshift bed, a collection of empty food wrappers and a notebook. I climbed into the attic and I approached the corner, my heart pounding in my chest. Flipping through the notebook, I found pages filled with notes about me my daily schedule, conversations that I had with Mike, even details about my family and friends. There were sketches of my face, detailed drawings of my apartment, 
and bizarre symbols that I didn't recognize. Panicking, I took the notebook and I climbed back down, closing the hatch as quietly as I could. I went back to my room and I locked the door, trying to make sense of what I just found. I didn't sleep all that night, and the next morning, I decided to confront Mike. When he came out of his room, I was waiting for him in the living room, and the notebook was on the coffee table. Mike, what the hell is this? I demanded, pointing to the notebook. His face went pale, and for a moment, he looked genuinely scared but then his expression changed to one of cold determination. It's not what you think, man. I can explain, he said. But I wasn't interested in his explanations. I... I want you out of here. Today, okay? I don't care what you have to say. I replied, my voice trembling with anger and fear. Mike didn't argue with that. He packed his things and then left within the hour. But before he did, he said something that chilled me to the bone. You shouldn't have gone up there, Daniel. You've made a mistake, he said, his eyes narrowing. Just remember, you brought this on yourself. After he left, I changed the locks and I tried to move on with my life. But the strange occurrences didn't stop. I started receiving anonymous emails and text messages, alluding to things only Mike could know. I even found a note slipped under my door one morning. It said, I'm still watching. I went to the police, but without concrete evidence, there wasn't much that they could do. They advised me to stay vigilant and report any further incidents. I also contacted Steve, the reference would vouch for Mike, only to find out that Steve had never heard of him and that the phone call had been set up. I decided to move out of the apartment and then find a new place, hoping to leave that nightmare behind me. I changed my phone number, I deleted all my social media apps, and I tried to start fresh. For a while, things seemed to get better. But then today, I received a package at my new address. Inside was the notebook that I had found in the attic, along with a note that simply said, You can't run from me. I'm going to the police tomorrow, and I'll post updates then. So, to Mike, screw you. I never thought that I would have a reason to share something on here. But after what happened last weekend, I felt it was important to warn others. This is a long one, so bear with me. My husband and I have a little girl named Emma, who just turned five. We adore her, but she's growing up fast, and we have accumulated so many baby clothes and also baby items over the years. We have no plans for any more children, with this economy, and also with my health problems. So, we decided that it was time to clear out the clutter. We had boxes upon boxes, taking up valuable space in our basement, and we were struggling with a leaky pipe down there that demanded immediate attention. A plumber's visit was urgently needed in our house, but the cost was higher than we anticipated. My husband suggested selling some of Emma's old clothes and baby items to help cover the expense. It seemed like a practical solution, and I thought Craigslist would be the quickest way to reach potential buyers. So, I took pictures of the baby clothes, the crib, and the various toys, and then I posted an ad on Craigslist. Within a couple of hours, I received a few inquiries, but one message stood out. A man who introduced himself as Mark. He expressed interest in buying everything for his pregnant wife. He seemed genuinely excited and then mentioned that they were expecting their first child and that they were on a tight budget. 
This really tugged at my heartstrings, and I was eager to help them. We arranged to meet in a busy shopping center parking lot the next evening. For safety reasons, I always prefer public areas for transactions, and my husband agreed to come with me. However, he got stuck at work and was running late. I didn't want to inconvenience Mark, so I decided to go ahead and meet him alone with my husband on his way. When I arrived, Mark was already there waiting by his car. He seemed friendly enough, and he thanked me repeatedly for the items. We started chatting, and he asked about my daughter, and I shared some stories about Emma. Everything seemed normal. Well, until it wasn't. Out of nowhere, Mark's demeanor shifted. He started making comments about how attractive and youthful I looked for a mother. I was taken aback, but I tried to steer the conversation back to the baby items. He wasn't having it. He leaned in closer and asked if I wanted to grab a drink with him sometime. I was stunned. I said, Excuse me? I'm married and so are you. I'm just here to sell some baby clothes. He ignored my protest and he even moved closer, his hand brushing against mine, and then he reached for my wrist. He said, Come on, just one drink. What's the harm, right? My heart was racing. I tried to pull my wrist away, but his grip tightened. I said, Let go of me, I demanded, louder this time. But he didn't. Instead, he started to drag me towards his car. Panic set in. The parking lot was unusually quiet, and there were no other people in sight. I struggled against his grip, my mind racing with fear. But just then, I saw my husband's car pull into the lot. Relief washed over me and I shouted for his name. My husband jumped out of the car and then sprinted towards us. Without a moment's hesitation, he punched the guy square in the face, causing him to stumble back and then release his grip on me. He didn't stick around. He scrambled to his feet and then ran back to his car, speeding off before we could even get his license plate. Shaken, I clung to my husband, trying to process what had just happened. We drove home in silence, the gravity of what had just happened weighing heavily on the both of us. My husband kept his hand on my knee, squeezing it gently every now and then as if to reassure himself that I was okay. I appreciated his presence more than ever. When we got home, I just put Emma to bed, my hand still trembling slightly. I didn't want her to sense any of my fear, so I told her an extra long bedtime story, and I sang her favorite lullaby until she finally drifted off to sleep. And only then did I allow myself to break down. My husband held me as I sobbed, the fear and adrenaline finally catching up to me. He rubbed my back and whispered soothing words, telling me that everything was going to be alright. Eventually, my tears subsided and we talked about what had happened. I am so, so sorry that I was late. I should have been there with you. His voice was thick with guilt. It's, it's not your fault. We couldn't have known that that guy was a creep. I, I just wish I had listened to my gut and I waited for you. I reassured him. The days that followed were a blur. We filed the police report, but without any concrete information about that buyer, there wasn't much that they could do. This incident has left me shaken but I was determined not to let fear rule my life. We decided to take a break from selling anything online for a while. Instead, I just donated the remaining baby items to a local women's shelter. It felt good to know that they were going to families in need. But this experience had truly left me wary of strangers. Life though returned to normal, but I couldn't shake the sense of an ease 
whenever I thought about that night. It just kept replaying in my mind, wondering how things might have gone differently. What if my husband didn't arrive when he did? That thought was too terrifying to dwell on. A few weeks later, I received a call from the police. The incident really changed me. I became more vigilant, more protective of my family. I started taking self-defense classes and encouraged my friends to do the same. It was empowering to know that I could defend myself if needed. But the fear lingered in the back of my mind. One evening, I was sitting on the porch, watching Emma play in the yard. My husband came out and then handed me a cup of tea. You okay? He asked, sitting down beside me. I nodded, taking a sip of the warm tea, and I answered, I'm, I'm getting there. Some days are better than the others, though. He wrapped his arm around me, pulling me close and said, We'll get through this together. And we did, slowly but surely. So, creepy baby clothes buyer, let's not meet ever again. I'm a 32-year-old guy living in a small town outside of Chicago. I recently bought an old house that needed a lot of work, but I saw the potential and I decided to go for it. Everything was going relatively smooth until I had a major plumbing issue. It was very late on a Sunday night and I was getting ready for bed when I noticed water pooling on the bathroom floor. I quickly realized that a pipe under the sink had burst and water was gushing out uncontrollably. I panicked. I didn't have the skills or tools to fix something like that and I couldn't just let the water keep flowing. My first thought was to turn off the main water supply, but, but I had no idea where it was located in the old house. And desperate, I decided to find an emergency plumber who could come out immediately and help me. I grabbed my phone and I started searching online. Most of the emergency plumbers that I called didn't answer or said that they couldn't come until the morning. So, that's when I turned to Craigslist. I found the listing for a 24-7 emergency plumber and then I called the number. A man named Joe answered and said that he could be at my place in 30 minutes. I was relieved and I gave him my address. And true to his word, Joe arrived around midnight. He was truly a burly man in his late 40s, with a scruffy beard and a toolbox in hand. He seemed a bit rough around the edges, but I figured that anyone willing to come out at this hour couldn't be too bad. Hey, thank you so much for coming, man, I said as I led him to the bathroom. The pipe under the sink burst and I can't stop the water. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Let me take a look. Joe answered. He dropped to his knees and then started fiddling with the pipes. After a few minutes, he managed to stop the water and then began making repairs. I watched him work for a bit, but then he turned to me and said, Listen, I've got this under control, but it's gonna take a while. You might as well go relax, and then I'll let you know when I'm done. I hesitated, but then I figured that he probably knew what he was doing, so I told him, All right, I'll be in the living room if you need anything. I left him to his work and then sat down on the couch trying to stay awake. About an hour later, Joe called out to me, Hey, can you come here for a sec? I got up and then went to the bathroom where Joe was standing with a slight frown on his face. I've got it mostly fixed, but there's a part that I need to replace. I don't have it with me, but I can come back tomorrow to finish up things. I sighed, exhausted but grateful. 
Oh, um, okay, that works. How much do I owe you for tonight? Joe hesitated and answered. Tell you what, I'll just charge you for the full job once I'm done tomorrow. Sound good? Sure, I replied, too tired to argue. Thanks again, Joe. See you tomorrow. He nodded and then packed up his tools, promising to return the next day. I watched him leave, feeling a bit uneasy but too exhausted to dwell on it. I locked up and then I went to bed, hoping the worst was over. The next morning, I woke up feeling somewhat refreshed and decided to check on the bathroom. The floor was still damp but at least the water had stopped. I spent the day cleaning up the mess and waiting for Joe to return. He showed up in the early afternoon, looking a bit more put together than the night before. I led him back into the bathroom and watched as he completed the repairs. This time, he worked quickly and efficiently, and within an hour the job was done. Well, you're all set, Joe said, standing up and wiping his hands on the rag. That should hold for a while. Just keep an eye on it, okay? And if you have any more issues, give me a call. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it, I replied. I was relieved to have the problem fixed. I then paid him for his work, and he left without incident. For the next few days, everything seemed fine. The pipe held up, the bathroom was back to normal. But for some reason... I started feeling uneasy. It just felt wrong. It felt like someone or something was always looking at me, always observing me, and the things that I do in my house. But I just can't seem to figure out why I was feeling this way. I thought it was just stress, especially after the plumbing issue that I have had recently. But one night, I decided to investigate once and for all. I began checking every nook and cranny of the house. As I moved through the rooms, I made sure to be silent so I can catch anything that's out of place. Then, I heard it. A little buzzing sound. It was so quick, and the volume was not much at all. If I had been a little bit more noisier, then I wouldn't hear it at all. I heard it inside the bathroom, it was around a corner that I didn't particularly care about. I checked it, and my heart nearly stopped when I found a tiny camera. Panic set in as I realized what was happening. I frantically searched the rest of the house, finding more hidden cameras and listening devices in various rooms. Someone had been watching and listening to me. My mind raced back to Joe the emergency plumber that I had called before. He had insisted on working alone that night, giving him ample opportunity to plant the devices. I immediately called the police and I explained the situation. They arrived quickly and conducted a thorough research, confirming my suspicions. I truly believe that Joe had indeed planted the cameras and bugs all throughout my house. I mean, who else could it be? The officers took the devices as evidence and assured me that they would investigate further. They also advised me to stay somewhere else for the time being, as it wasn't safe to remain in the house. I packed the bag, stayed with a friend, feeling a mix of fear and anger. A few days later, the police contacted me with an update. It was definitely Joe. They told me that Joe was a known criminal with a history for breaking and entering, as well as installing surveillance equipment in people's homes. He had been on the run for years, using his plumbing job as a friend to gain access to houses. They managed to track him down and finally arrest him. But the whole experience left me shaken. I can't believe how easily I had let a stranger into my home and how much trust I had placed on him. The thought of someone watching my every move, listening to my conversations, 
and invading my privacy was horrifying. The lesson I got from this is to always make sure to thoroughly vet anyone that you hire for work. To the creepy plumber who violated my home and my privacy, Joe, let's never meet again. Hi everyone, I'm a 29-year-old guy living in Seattle. I'm working as a graphic designer and I'm a long-time lurker here. I've read countless stories on this sub and I never thought that I'd have one of my own to share. But after what happened, I need to get this off my chest. Like many people, I've been struggling to make ends meet and I needed some extra income to cover my bills and maybe stash away a bit of savings. That's when I turned to Craigslist, hoping to find a part-time job that wouldn't interfere with my regular work hours. I spent a few evenings scrolling through listings, mostly coming across spammy ads or jobs that required way more time than I could afford. But just as I was about to give up, I found a listing that seemed perfect. It said, Part-time cleaner needed for a large house, flexible hours, male only. The male only part for a cleaner ad was a bit odd to me, but I just assumed that maybe heavy lifting was required, so that's why they needed a man. The pay was decent and the ad mentioned that no previous experience was necessary. I figured, why not give it a shot? I reached out to the poster a woman named Margaret, who quickly responded and seemed eager to hire someone. We arranged to meet at her house the following day for an interview and also a tour of the house. She said that it would only take an hour or so and I could start immediately if everything went well. The day came and I drove out to Margaret's house. It was located in a quiet upscale neighborhood on the outskirts of the city the house itself was massive. It was a three-story Victorian with intricate woodwork and a huge well-maintained lawn. It was the kind of place you would expect to see in a movie, not on a Craigslist ad, you know. I parked my car. I walked up to the stone path to the front door, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness. I rang the doorbell, and a few moments later, the door swung open to reveal Margaret. She looked to be in her mid-fifties with graying hair, but it was pulled back into a neat bun and a sharp, almost piercing blue eyes. She was dressed in a tasteful, if somewhat old-fashioned dress and had an air of authority about her. Hello, you must be Daniel, she said with a warm smile. I'm Margaret. Please come in. Thanks. Nice to meet you, I replied, stepping inside. The inside of the house was just as impressive as the outside. Antique furniture, elegant chandeliers, and intricate rugs that looked like they cost more than my car. It was clear that Margaret had money. I felt so out of place being surrounded by these. She then led me through the house, pointing out the areas that would need cleaning and explaining the task that she had in mind. It seemed straightforward enough. Vacuuming, dusting, mopping, and the occasional deep cleaning of the bathrooms and kitchen. As we walked, Margaret shared a bit about herself. She was a widow, having lost her husband a few years back, and had no children, she admitted that maintaining such a large house on her own was becoming too much for her, hence the need for help. Despite her outwardly friendly demeanor, there was something about Margaret that made me uneasy. She stared to me too intently. She was also a bit touchy. She would occasionally place a hand on my arm, lingering longer than felt appropriate. But the pay was good, and I really needed the money, so I just brushed off my concerns. After the tour, Margaret led me to the basement, 
which he said would need the most attention. The basement was large and cluttered with old furniture. There were some boxes and various knickknacks in it. And as soon as we reached the bottom of the stairs, she turned to me. I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to give you a little test, just to make sure that you're thorough. She said, with a little disturbing smile in her face. Sure, no problem, I replied, trying to sound enthusiastic. Great, I'll just wait upstairs, take your time, and when you're done, come find me. She headed back up the stairs, leaving me alone in the dimly lit basement. I set to work, dusting and organizing as best as I could, and after about half an hour, I decided that I had done a decent enough job and I headed back to the stairs. But when I reached the top, the door was closed. I tried the handle, but it wouldn't budge. Panic started to set in as I pounded on the door. Margaret, the door stuck. I shouted, hoping that she could hear me. Her voice came from the other side, calm and almost playful. Oh, I know. It's not stuck, Daniel. It's locked. What? Why? Let me out of here. I demanded, my heart racing. There was a pause before she responded. I will, on one condition. What condition? I asked, dreading the answer. I want you to agree to have sex with me. Her words hit me like a ton of bricks, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you insane? Let me out of here! Not until you agree, she replied, her tone cold and unyielding. I was trapped, and I knew I had to think fast. Of course, I knew I was bigger and stronger than her, but what if she had a weapon or something? I had no idea what she was capable of and the last thing that I wanted was to be stuck in that basement any longer. Okay, I agree, but just this one time, okay? I said, trying to sound convincing. So, just open the door so we can be done with it. There was a silence for a moment, and then I heard the sound of the lock clicking. I braced myself ready to bolt the moment the door opened. And as soon as the door cracked open, I shoved it with all of my might, catching Margaret off guard. She stumbled back and I took off, sprinting through the house and out the front door. I didn't stop running until I reached my car and then I peeled out of the driveway, my heart pounding in my chest. I drove around aimlessly for what felt like hours, trying to process what had just happened to me. I felt shame. I felt embarrassed. And I couldn't bring myself to call the police. What would I even say? That a woman threatened to keep me in her basement if I didn't have sex with her? And that I agreed to have sex with her just to escape? It felt so humiliating. Maybe I was just anxious or confused or maybe in shock. I don't know. I did not know what to do. In the end, I decided to just let it go. I blocked Margaret's number and I deleted all of our correspondence. I never went back to that neighborhood and I haven't used Craigslist for anything since. So, Margaret, you deranged woman who tried to trap me in your basement, let's never meet again. Hey everyone, I have been a lurker here for years, but after what happened to me last week, I feel compelled to share my story in the hopes that it stops someone else from making the same mistake. This is my first post on here, so please bear with me if it's a bit rough around the edges. I'm a 34-year-old guy living in Portland, Oregon. 
I work a regular 9 to 5 job as a software developer, and like most people, I have my hobbies to keep me sane. One of those hobbies is kayaking. Growing up, my family spent summers at a cabin by a lake. I have nothing but fond memories of paddling out and exploring the water. It's a peaceful escape from my daily grind, and I've been meaning to get back into it. However, living in the city and dealing with my student loans, my rent, and just life in general, I couldn't justify dropping a ton of money on a brand new kayak. That's when I thought of Craigslist. I've used it before for smaller purchases, for furniture, some gadgets, that sort of thing. So I figured, why not see if anyone's selling a kayak for a decent price, right? I started browsing the listings, and as luck would have it, I found one almost immediately. It was listed for $200, which is a steal considering that it was described as barely used and in great condition. The seller's name was Rick, and he lived a couple of hours away in a rural area just outside of Eugene. I texted him, and he responded almost immediately, saying that the kayak was still available and that he would be happy to meet that weekend. We agreed on Saturday morning, and I was excited at the prospect of finally getting back on the water, and I figured a little road trip wouldn't be the worst way to spend a Saturday. When Saturday came around, I packed up my car and set out early. The drive was pretty uneventful for the most part, with the city gradually giving way to the rolling fields and the dense forest of rural Oregon. About two hours in, I turned onto a narrow winding road that led deeper into the woods. The GPS indicated that I was getting close, but the further I went, the more uneasy I felt. My cell service was spotty at best, and the few houses that I passed looked old and abandoned. Finally, I arrived at the address Rick had given me. It was an old, weathered, beaten farmhouse at the end of a long dirt driveway. There was a large barn off to one side, and everything about the place just screamed creepy. But I have driven all this way, and I did not want to turn back empty-handed. I pulled up to the house and Rick came out to greet me. He looked to be in his late fifties with graying hair and a lean, almost wiry frame. He was friendly enough, but there was something off about him that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Maybe it was the way his eyes seemed to linger a bit too long, or the way his smile didn't quite reach his eyes. Hey there, you must be Joe, he said, extending a hand. I'm Rick. Glad you could make it. Yeah, thanks for meeting me, I replied, shaking his hand. So, where's the kayak? Rick gestured toward the barn. It's in there. Come on, I'll show you. As we walked toward the barn, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The whole place had an air of neglect like it hadn't seen a proper maintenance in years. The bar door creaked loudly as Rick pulled it open, revealing a dimly lit interior filled with old farming equipment and various odds and ends. And there it was, the kayak. It looked just like the pictures, maybe even better. It was a sleek bright red model that seemed out of place among the dusty, decaying surroundings. There she is, Rick said, patting the kayak. I told you, it was in great condition. I walked over and ran my hand along the hull. It did look great, but my unease hadn't subsided. Still, I'd come this far, and it was a good deal. Well, it looks good, I said trying to sound enthusiastic. So, let's load it up? Sure thing, Rick replied. But first, 
Would you mind giving me a hand with something in the back? I got an old generator that needs moving, and my back's been acting up, you know. Every instinct told me to get out of there, but politeness and the prospect of a cheap kayak overrode my better judgment. I answered him. Uh, sure. Um, go ahead. Lead the way. Rick led me through the barn and out the back door. There was a small clearing behind the barn, bordered by the thick woods. In the middle of the clearing was a large rusted generator. It didn't look like it still worked, though. As we approached it, Rick stopped and turned to me. You've ever seen anything like this? He asked, his tone oddly conversational. Mm, no, can't say I have. I replied, glancing around nervously. Rick's demeanor changed in an instant. His friendly facade dropped, replaced by a cold, calculating expression. He said, You know, Joe, there's something you should know about this place. And before I could react, he pulled out a knife and then slashed at my arm. I stumbled back, clutching the wound, adrenaline flooding my system. What the hell, man? I shouted, trying to put distance between us. Rick advanced slowly, knife glinting in the sunlight. You're not the first one to come here looking for a deal, and you won't be the last. Panic surged as I realized the gravity of my situation. I turned, and I bolted towards the woods, branches whipping at my face as I ran so fast. I could hear Rick behind me, moving swiftly despite his age. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually, I burst out onto a road. A car was approaching and I ran into the middle of the street, waving my arms frantically. The driver, a middle-aged woman, slammed on her brakes and then jumped out. What happened to you? She exclaimed, taking in my disheveled appearance and the blood on my arm. Please, please, you have to help me. There's, there's a guy back there and he's trying to kill me. I gasped, barely able to catch my breath. She didn't hesitate. She ushered me into her car and then sped off, dialing 911 as she drove. I looked back, half expecting to see Rick emerging from the woods, but there was no sign of him. The police arrived quickly, and after giving my statement, they searched the area and they found the farmhouse and the barn, but Rick was nowhere to be found. Inside the barn, they had discovered a hidden room with various items. There were wallets, IDs, even car keys. And it became clear that Rick had been luring people there for who knows how long. I'm still shaken by this experience and I can't help but think about what might have happened if I hadn't managed to escape. I've deleted Craigslist from my phone and I don't think I'll ever use it again. So, to Rick, the psychopath with a kayak, let's never meet again. Hi everyone. I'm a 27-year-old guy living in Chicago, and I use Craigslist. For those who don't know what it is, Craigslist is a popular online platform where people can buy and sell items. You can also find jobs, housing, and also offer services. It's like an online classified section of a newspaper, but with a much broader reach. You can find some great deals there too. But... As I recently learned, you can also find yourself in some pretty terrifying situations. This happened to me about six months ago, and I'm still shaken up by it. I recently moved into a new apartment after finally saving up enough to leave my old rundown place. The new apartment was a huge improvement. It was spacious, had better lighting, and in a nicer neighborhood. 
The only problem was that I hardly had any furniture. My budget was tight and buying new furniture was out of the question. And that's when I turned to Craigslist. I spent a few evenings browsing the free section, hoping to find some decent items that people were giving away. And that's when I stumbled upon a listing for a free couch. The picture showed a slightly worn but still very nice leather couch. It was a deep brown color and looked comfortable, definitely better than the old futon that I've been using. The ad mentioned that the owner was moving out of state and they needed to get rid of it quickly. And that sounded perfect to me. I contacted the owner, a man named Tom, and he responded almost immediately. He said the couch was still available and then gave me his address, which was about a 20-minute drive from my apartment. We arranged for me to come by the next day to pick it up. And the following evening, I borrowed a friend's truck and then drove to Tom's place. It was in a quiet suburban neighborhood and the house looked well kept. I felt a bit nervous as I parked the truck and I walked up to the front door. But I reminded myself that this was just a simple furniture pickup. Tom answered the door after the first knock. He was in his late 40s with graying hair and a friendly smile. He invited me in and then led me into the living room where the couch was waiting. It looked just as good in person as it did in the pictures. Here it is, Tom said, patting the back of the couch. I'm glad someone can use it. It's just too good to throw away, you know. Oh, thanks, I really appreciate it. I replied. I just moved into a new place, so this will absolutely be perfect. Tom helped me carry the couch out to the truck, and we had some friendly small talk along the way. He told me that he was moving to Florida for a new job and didn't want to deal with moving all of his furniture. He seemed like a really nice guy, and everything felt normal. After we loaded the couch into the truck, I thanked him again and then drove back to my apartment. I managed to get the couch inside with the help of a neighbor and then we set it up in my living room. I was exhausted from all the lifting, but I was also thrilled to have a proper piece of furniture. That night, I settled onto the couch to watch some TV. It was incredibly comfortable and I felt like I really had lucked out. But as the night went on, I started to notice something strange. My dog, Max, who usually loved lounging on the couch, refused to go near it. He just sat there, staring at it and growling softly at times. I chalked it up to him being unsettled by the new smell and then decided to give him some time to adjust. Over the next few days, Max's behavior around the couch didn't improve. In fact, it got worse. He would bark at it, refuse to come into the living room, and even started having accidents in the other rooms. It was completely out of character for him, and I began to feel uneasy myself. So one night, I finally decided to investigate. I took a flashlight, and I closely examined the couch. At first, I didn't see anything unusual, but then I noticed a small tear in the fabric on the underside. I pulled at the tear, widening it enough to see inside. And my heart nearly stopped when I saw what was hidden there. Skeletal remains, cleaned and carefully wrapped in cloth, and next to the bones was an old leather-bound diary. This discovery made my skin crawl. The bones didn't emit any foul smell, lightly because they had been meticulously cleaned. Well, I immediately called the police to report the gruesome find. The officers arrived quickly and cordoned off my apartment. They took the remains in the diary for forensic analysis, and the lead detective assured me that they would conduct a thorough investigation and that I had done the right thing by reporting it. A few days later, 
one of the officers called to update me. They had confirmed that the remains were human, but further identification would take time. The investigation was ongoing and they were looking into Tom's background more extensively. I moved out of that apartment as soon as I could, unable to shake the horror of what I had found. Max, my loyal companion, finally seemed to calm down once we left. This experience left a lasting impression on me. I learned to trust my instincts and to be wary of deals that seem too good to be true. So, to Tom, the deranged man with the free couch, I hope you stay far away wherever you are. And to anyone reading this, please, be careful with dealing with strangers online. You don't want free human bones. Hello everyone, I'm Emma. I'm a 29-year-old single mom living in a small town in Pennsylvania. My son, Ethan, is three years old and is the absolute light of my life. Since Ethan's father left us shortly after he was born, it has just been the two of us. I don't have any family nearby. My parents passed away years ago and my siblings live across the country. So when it comes to babysitting, I rely heavily on a reputable agency to find babysitters when I need them. I work from home most of the time, which allows me to be with Ethan, but occasionally, I have to go out to meet clients in person. These meetings are crucial for my job, and canceling them often isn't an option for me. This particular situation arose when one of my regular clients scheduled the last-minute meeting. It was an important one, and I couldn't afford to miss it. I contacted the babysitting agency that I usually use, and I managed to book a babysitter for that evening. The agency has always been reliable, and I've never had any issues with their sitters. However, about two hours before the meeting, I received a call from the agency. The babysitter they had assigned to me had a family emergency and they couldn't make it. They were incredibly apologetic and assured me that they would find a replacement immediately. But after 20 minutes of waiting, I got another call. They didn't have any other sitters available on such a short notice. Panic began to set in. I couldn't cancel the meeting. It was too important. Desperate, I started calling friends and acquaintances. I even tried my neighbors, but no one was available. I was running out of options fast. In a moment of desperation, I turned to Craigslist. I know, I know, Craigslist isn't exactly known for being the safest place to find a babysitter, but I was out of options. I scrolled through several ads and one caught my eye. Experienced Babysitter Available References Upon Request The ad seemed legitimate enough. The poster, who identified herself as Kelly, claimed to have years of experience and also provided a phone number. I decided to take a chance and called her. Kelly answered on the second ring. She sounded friendly, maybe a bit too eager, but I was in no position to be picky. I explained my situation and she assured me that she could be at my house within half an hour. I asked for the references and she gave me a few names and numbers. I quickly called one of them and it checked out. They gave a glowing review of Kelly, so I decided to go ahead. And true to her word, Kelly arrived about 30 minutes later. She was in her late 30s with a friendly enough appearance. But as soon as she stepped inside, I felt an odd sense of an ease. She was dressed a bit too formally for a babysitting gig, and her smile seemed forced. I pushed my discomfort aside and I showed her around the house, pointing out where Ethan's things were and also explaining his bedtime routine. 
Kelly listened intently, but she also kept glancing around the house, almost like she was assessing it. It was really unsettling, but I just tried to stay calm. Ethan, usually very sociable, seemed hesitant around Kelly. He clung to my leg and didn't want to let go. This was very unlike him, and it just added to my growing unease. As I was explaining the rules and instructions, I noticed a few things that set off alarm bells to me. Kelly's responses were either overly enthusiastic or strangely vague. When I asked her about her previous babysitting experience, she mentioned working for several families but was oddly reluctant to share specific details. Then, she did something that sent a chill down my spine. While I was talking, she reached out and touched Ethan's hair, almost petting him. Ethan recoiled, and I felt a surge of protectiveness. Something about the gesture felt off, almost predatory. I decided to test her a bit. I remember asking her, Um, can you tell me about the family you worked for last week? Kelly hesitated. Then she gave a vague answer that didn't quite sit right with me. It was along the lines of, Oh, um, uh, they were lovely, two kids, very well behaved. I can't remember their names right now, but the parents were doctors, I think. My heart started racing. She didn't mention specific names or details, which was strange for someone who claimed to have years of experience. My gut was screaming at me that something was wrong. I knew that I couldn't leave Ethan with this woman. I apologized and told Kelly that I had changed my mind and that I wouldn't need her services after all. Her reaction was immediate and alarming. Her friendly demeanor vanished, replaced by a cold, almost menacing stare. She said, You're canceling on me now? After I drove all the way here? I remember feeling protective but also very apologetic because I do understand her part and I think I told her. I'm really, really sorry, Kelly, but I don't feel comfortable leaving my son right now. I'll pay you for your time, but I would need you to leave. Kelly didn't budge. She stood there, glaring at me, and I felt a rising sense of panic. I went to another room with Ethan and I grabbed my phone, discreetly dialing 911. I was explaining the situation to the dispatcher in a hushed voice. They assured me that the officers were on their way. When Kelly realized that I was on the phone with the police, she exploded. She said, You're calling the cops on me? For what? Trying to help you? She was shouting as she was taking a step closer to me. I held my ground with my heart pounding in my chest. Please leave, I said firmly, clutching Ethan tightly. Just then, I heard the sound of police sirens. Kelly's eyes widened and she muttered something under her breath before storming out of the house. I locked the door behind her with my hand shaking. The police arrived moments later and I explained everything to them. They took my statement and reassured me that I had done the right thing by calling them. They also advised me to be more cautious about who I hire in the future and just to stick to reputable agencies, even if it's inconvenient at times. After the police left, I called my client and I explained the situation. Thankfully, they were incredibly understanding and agreed to reschedule the meeting. They were parents themselves and understood the lengths that we would go to protect our children. I was shaken but relieved. I couldn't believe how close I had come to potentially putting my son in serious danger. The whole experience left me feeling paranoid. Looking back, I realized how dangerous it was to turn to Craigslist in my desperation. It's definitely a lesson that I won't forget. I have since reconnected with a few distant relatives 
and also built a stronger support network to avoid ever being in that situation again. And to all the parents reading this, please, please, be careful when hiring someone to take care of your kids. Trust your instincts and don't let desperation cloud your judgment. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate it. I would also like to give some extra love to my Patreon members, my channel members, and also my tippers. Thank you so, so much. If you would like to extend a little bit more support for the channel, don't forget to leave a like and a comment down below. If you would like to become a Patreon member, a channel member, a tipper, or even to buy merch, check out the links in the description below. Again, thank you. And I hope you stay scared because your fear feeds me.